Hi everybody to our final session um, and welcome to Kathleen Kinsella who is Director of Employee Engagement and Inclusion at Capita and Tamara Gillen, founder of Wealthier Her um, and CEO. Um, so this session is very much to interrogate the idea for the women that aren't running businesses, the, the women that kind of are still going into the office or haven't been going into the office in um, the last 18 months because of the pandemic and the working from home explosion. I suppose what we want to really do is interrogate whether this kind of great revolution of how we work and hybrid working and flexible working, is it kind of really helping women or actually has it had the opposite effect is it hindering our careers in any way i think we've all been on a massive journey with this and i think many companies are still working all of this out as we kind of slowly return back to work um pre-pandemic there was lots of chat about kind of presenteeism in the workplace and how this was bad for women but is this kind of more hybrid loose flexible working is that really um is that how does the fan, the fantasy of that kind of match the reality? So really that's, um, you know, these are kind of the kind of pressing questions for every woman that kind of has to go into the office um, this, um, these days and kind of maybe ask for flexible working or expect flexible working now in this kind of hybrid world. And then it, 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 um, it gets turned down or how do you, how do you ask for it? Um, so first um, I'd really like to go to um, you, Catelyn. I think you've done some research on this for Capita. Um, so I'd really be keen to hear how that's kind of panned out in your own company and how you're tackling it. Yeah, thank you so much. So it's a really interesting one because the pandemic has put us all into a world of work that's like nothing we've experienced in our lifetimes. So when we got into the, the depths of it last year and realized it was gonna be here to stay, we said, well, we need to listen to our employees and find out what this looks like, what this means and what we should do. So we did quite a large scale um, series of surveys and listening sessions with employees. And we came away from that and developed up a whole, what we call our new ways of working. Although by now it's, it's a little less new and a little bit more than normal. And essentially that meant for every role in the business, we assessed whether or not it needed to be a physically located role or whether it could be what I like to call now location agnostic. Uh, and if that role could be location agnostic, then we've made it permanently an option for employees to choose and have control over how they work. And that could be hybrid working. It could be fully remote or home based, or it could be that some people really still like to come into an office. And we actually made that a contractual change for people to give them some stability in a world that has definitely not been stable. What's been fascinating is that the whole world has seen that productivity has not decreased throughout the, the pandemic. So prior to COVID, people would often say, we can't give people flexibility. We can't let them work at home. The business would fall down. It wouldn't work. And what the last year has proven is that that is absolutely not the case. And I know we'll talk about today, if anything, people are working longer and harder, and that's a separate issue to manage. So I think it's about changing not just where we work, but our whole approach to how we manage our outputs and outcomes and what our managers and team leaders are doing to look after their teams throughout this. But certainly what it's proven to us is that there is no barrier to flexibility and having a lot more uh, options in the workplace. Whereas previously, we maybe thought that there were barriers that just truly don't exist. Sure. And Tamara, is that something that you, you've you seen in your workplace? Um, or have you seen kind of a kind of a wave of it, it's good, it's bad? Or how has it panned out? Because obviously you're a kind of a leader, you're a team leader. Um, you've had to manage teams. Does that or is that does that work for them? I think, you know, I was very much a naysayer in that I was very actually, I've been working for over 20 years and I was flexibility in its fullest form is something I was always very nervous about. But actually, I think it did, you know, the pandemic, how we all had to adapt our teams, our people, ourselves proved that we can work differently we can work from home in a different way however I do think it needs touching on what Kat said it, I think it needs a reinvention because I don't think um, we have had a lot of feedback from our team um, also companies that we work with that are experiencing this with their teams that there are people who are in 
and there are people who are out of work, you know, working remotely or, or, or location agnostic. And in fact, those people that aren't in you know, are saying, actually, I'm having a different experience than those that are back in from a relationship build. One thing that someone said to me early in my career, it's not what you know, it's who knows you. And I do know from feedback from my own teens and other big companies I work with that relationships are different you know zoom is very much or on screen is very much or we get on with the job at hand relationships are a different matter so i think building those relationships that's changed i think we've also seen a lot of feedback from our teams and again within companies that younger people in the workforce learn from observing other people in work and you do not have it in the same way um, on screen which is as i said is a lot more about let's get down to what tasks we need to fulfill um, and then and also touching on the point that i think that it is there's there's been an ebb and flow that i've experienced for my own team and my own self where people are working longer harder boundaries have gone so so actually you know because we're working from home it's been wonderful to have time with my son more more time my team have expressed that with their children drop-offs being there for those moments but in fact you're working on the fringes of your day in a flexible way means that you feel like there isn't always an off and I've seen from feedback from my own team my own self that that is taking its toll on women so going back to the beginning we need to rethink it because I don't think we have the nirvana that's going to work for everybody because of all of those reasons and Catelyn is that um I haven't heard of location agnostic and my question to you would be do you think people always know what is good for them so is there a difference between desire and want versus actually what could be good because I think some people have told me that for example I think tomorrow what you touch on there is um some younger people have kind of they they want this um like flexible working they don't want to come in as much um they haven't had that experience so much of community of work um where they can be mentored and get on and so could that be a downside for them getting on so that's the first point and the second point is there a danger for women when they get, especially when they have children, that they're seen as the default parent? So they're the ones that then choose not to be in the office. And again, that can have a detrimental impact on their career because they'll be the ones always asking for it. And then there'll be invisibility. So invisibility for youngers and mothers. Is there, is there, is there slightly a double-edged edged sword where it could backfire? So many good questions there. So first, your first one about, do people always know what's good for them? It's a really interesting one, but I think in today's world, we need to get away a little bit from the idea that as the employer, we always know what's right. You know, looking after engagement for 50,000 people who we employ around the world, the one thing I know is I'm definitely never gonna know the experience of all those people and what's right for them. So I need to ask and listen. And in fact, my kind of mantra at work is, um, to listen, learn, act, measure, repeat. And you're not always going to get it right. We're going to get it wrong. And that's why we learn, we measure, we look at, okay, what are the outcomes from what we tried? This is the intervention. Did it work? No. Okay, let's go back. Let's listen. Let's learn. Let's act again. And we might need to tweak that. And I think because we've never been in this pandemic environment, we're doing a lot of that right now. We're learning. Um, but I certainly wouldn't want to make assumptions for any group of our employees. I want to give them opportunities. I want to coach them. I want to mentor them and set up mentoring relationships and coaching relationships. Um, you know, to Tamara's point, those are even more important now that there's this disconnected uh, environment. But I don't want to assume I know what's best for them because, you know, you can have a 20 year old who happens to work extremely well in uh, a more isolated, flexible environment and you can have one that doesn't. It, it's not something we can classify, I think, quite so simply, but it is, we need to keep monitoring it. To your point about the default parent, that is an excellent one. Um, I'm a parent, I have uh, 18 month old twins. So I had babies in the, the start of lockdown, which not something I would have you know, necessarily chosen to happen, no. in, but that's the joy of COVID. Um, mothers being seen as a default parent is still a significant issue and the data tells us this. We, we hear this from our employees, from friends, from family members. However, in the past, because parent mothers tended to be this default parent, it could be so restrictive on career opportunities. So, for example, you might say, well, I can't work the hours in the office and I can't do that big job that's coming up for 
uh, you know, recruitment. So I'm not even going to apply for it because I have to leave at three and pick up the kids because I'm that default parent. Now, we can't fix society overnight. It takes time for us to make these changes. What we can do as an employer is say, you know what, you can pick up your kids at three o'clock or four o'clock or wherever, whenever you need to, and you can still do that big job because we're going to give you the flexibility to say, we don't care if you do a bit of your job at 5 p.m. and a bit at 10 a.m. and a bit at 10 p.m. if that's what works for you. I think we very much have to remember Tamara's point about well-being and about people being able to switch off. But as a manager, that comes down to how you make sure your team is getting the flexibility to do their job around their life, but they're not letting work take over their life. And again, this is a really one-to-one -one relationship. I think the key is good managers, because if you have a good manager, they can make that work. If you have mm -hmm. someone who doesn't know what to do or how to handle that scenario, then you get people who are burning out, overworked, no crossover. And it's a really different skill. We have such a tradition in Western countries, and I've seen it in Australia, I've seen it here in the UK, of promoting people for technical skill. And those people may not be good people managers, and they weren't selected or promoted for that. So we need to train mm -hmm. or select them to be people who can cope with talking about wellness and mental health and all these different things that we're now asking team managers to do. Whereas in the past, mm -hmm. maybe all they had to do was make sure that their team kind of delivered these checkbox items. The last point really, mm -hmm. because I know I'm talking a lot, you mentioned invisibility. I think in the past, women could become really invisible and that could cause you know, career opportunities tomorrow, you made the point, you need to be known, you need people to know who you are. So for us, as we're coming into this post pandemic world in Capita, and we're setting up what the new normal looks like, it's really important that we have some ground rules that we carry forward. So for example, our executive team has committed to not meeting in person going forward on a regular basis, because that does create that second class citizen where if you're the person on the phone as it used to be spider phones with a good old way of working mm -hmm. or on teams or zoom you then aren't as engaged as the rest of the room so instead they all stay on teams or on zoom even if they're in the same building so that for that one or two those one or two people who aren't in the room they're on equal footing and i think little mm -hmm. decisions that make such a difference in terms of that invisibility and engagement for everybody equally. Yeah. And um, Tamara, to, to you, um, kind of as, as a, a kind of leader and a, a, a manager, uh, often we talk about um, managers managing their teams and um, looking after the well-being of their, their kind of workforce. But obviously, managers are part of the workforce. They're also kind of, um, you know, people that have to go to work every day. And it, are we in a danger of we're looking after kind of our teams so much? Maybe the managers, the people at the top of the tree, then get overburdened because they're they're the ones having to make it all work um and they kind of forget that them themselves they are also a worker i think that's such a brilliant question and i think as a leader as an entrepreneur and having done a lot of research with entrepreneurs that are women and leaders that are women uh we definitely see that there is a difference between men and women women are more stretched as a result of having to do these kind of the stretch of their lives into being more there as a parent or that kind of flexible working. And I think that I know I've had Anya Highmarch who's speaking say to me, I've never been more stretched as a leader. I have never been more stretched in terms of, I, I run a team that's very dominated by women. Wealthy her, I couldn't help myself. Uh, we do have men, but in fact, you know, I've watched those women in my team go through, whether it's, I've got three children under five, not twins like Caitlin, <laughs> Caitlin, but you know, I've got three, I've got two, you know, a set of twins. I've got three children under five. I, can't, I have to stop working. I literally cannot continue. I know as myself, as a single mother, you know, very, very challenged in terms of managing, you know, what has been required to say to my team, keep going, come together. I know the working conditions are hard. I know, dear, you know, younger team, you're working from your bedroom in a shared house. It's tough. And so I think you're completely right, actually, that protecting leaders and managers and actually arming them for this new normal. And I think that if you look back on your own career, I would say, 
I've had some great managers, but I've also have had a lot of bad managers. And so I think commitment to train people to be better managers and to develop them, but also to be aware that they have, as leaders with responsibility for people, their livelihoods, their happiness, their well-being, their productivity through this, adapting business models, it's been really tough. And I wish, and I've spoken to many leaders top law firms in private banks as my clients partners and they've said I wish I could tell my team to go home for a month but we are so busy adapting to the new normal I can't I wish I could say turn off but I can't because we have a demand you know to keep going and so that's why I think this sort of thinking about this topic now is so important and thinking how do you train how do you support and how do you adapt and I think to the point and the question you asked Caitlin around sometimes people don't know you know, I've had experiences, as I think you've had, of saying to people, you know, very nervous to come back and we're only doing two days a week together. And in fact, getting them over that fear hurdle because of perhaps they've had, they might have a medical tradition has changed the way they feel versus working alone at home over such mm -hmm. a period of time. And I have seen that shift. So I definitely think there's work to be done at all levels and we have a challenge and we have an opportunity on our hands. Mm -hmm. Caitlin, um, just for you, obviously, um, you've kind of look, looked at this in, in great depth. Have you had any surprises? Because, I mean, for the last year, I mean, I've had people say to me, if I have to do another Zoom call, that, that's, the end, that's going to be the end of me. And then suddenly the Zoom call is here forevermore. And it, you could be like in a nightmare scenario. A lot of people have said, I'm desperate to get back into the office. So have you, in a weird way, have people... Uh, been reminded of kind of the joys of an office I suppose and have you been surprised about how many people might want to come back? To be honest Albert so we opened up our offices in line with appropriate COVID guidance a little while ago and made hubs available so people can book desks and go back in we also did some really nice things so people can book a desk beside a friend or a colleague so you can see who's sitting there and, and arrange to go and meet with them because to the point you've both made it, it is about people and relationships, but we haven't had a huge take up of it yet, if I'm honest. Uh, we were expecting a little more and it hasn't been big. And I think there's a few things, there's nervousness, you know, people are still worried about the, the disease and uh, the safety. We've got very strict um, measures in place to, to look after our people, but it is still a concern. I think a lot of people have, developed a new way of living and therefore they're just not as keen to go back in certainly not five days we're not seeing much appetite from the majority of employees to go back in five days a lot of people say you know what i want to go in when there's something that's going to be really meaty and fun so team strategy days or brainstorming sessions or where you want people to get really creative most people seem to be saying absolutely that's when i want to be in a room and have whiteboards and pens and all those fun things mm -hmm. But when it's is the that, day, is, sorry? is that a is that a worry for employ employers that if we almost forgotten what work is and we just want the fun bits, we want it to be nice and fun, but isn't the reality of work sometimes it's not, and sometimes it's a means to an end. And is there a worry that if if the balance tips too far, then we will miss out at all? That. Tomorrow, I think the, sure. the proof has been in the pudding that people are very productive at home. So I think it's more about choosing where to do with which types of work, because we're certainly not seeing our employees are sitting at home and watching daytime TV and not delivering on their objectives. And that was the impression that some people had before COVID of, of people who worked from home. So that's not happening. I think it's more about different types of work suit different yeah. environments better. And we're seeing people make those choices in a more strategic way. Okay. And Tamara, in your in your team, how do you measure efficiency? Because sometimes people can think, well, I'm at my computer at, you know, and the, what the time would be I'm, when I'm commuting. Um, and I'm past, you know, I think there's some statistics that show that people are working two and a half hours more while they're working from home than they, they would have done. And they're feeling quite burnt out, this at home working burnout. But how do you measure how efficient they're being because there's a lot of spark and work that's not work but is work that happens kind of not when you're not in front of that community um computer so tomorrow i just wondered how do you measure kind of what work is actually being done and whether they're doing it as well as it could be done 
It's a very good question again. And I think just picking up to what Caitlin said, I think that we have also found that when we do to what we call togetherness, when you are doing strategy, when you're doing brainstorming and people are like, this is brilliant. And we do so much, we're so much more productive, but there is still work to be done. And so I think your question is brilliant. And as an entrepreneur, you know, we have to, we have to, we have to measure effectiveness and we have to monitor that in the most positive way. And it's really difficult because one, one of the things that I've been saying to my leadership team is let's focus on outcomes. What outcomes are we asking of people in their role so that we can think of a new way not monitoring their time but measuring their outcomes and that those outcomes need to become more and more important to our business than ever before so that we've got a way to say no matter how you're doing it however you're delivering your day you are achieving your outcomes and so we've started a whole new language of sort of what outcomes not what actions not what time but what outcomes have you achieved what's blocking those outcomes what can we do to sort of help you overcome those and so I think that shift in focus is really really important I sat at a dinner with them and a male um, entrepreneur really successful tech entrepreneur recently and he said you've got to you've got to incentivize people as well if you want to have them in which I thought was an interesting don't mandate incentivize Mm -hmm. it because it does change the dynamic Uh, so Mm -hmm. I think those things are 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 important and looking at kind of new ways to sort of talk about how you drive outcomes um i think is is the key to that okay and caitlin just just um i think we're we're kind of we're kind of on our last last 10 minutes down now how have you ensured that your company you don't have kind of a um flex haves and flex have nots because we've heard of this the new kind of people that only want to work when you know Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, um, so no one seems to wants to make work Monday or Friday if they want kind of a, a part time role, for example. So that person that's then going, actually, you can have flexible working, but you can't have the hours you want. I mean, and then does it cause kind of new problems? I guess for for managers and companies. I think it's really important to be really clear, consistent, and fair. Uh, And I find, you know, through a lot of experience of managing different teams where I've had different people who've got caring responsibilities or other interests or part-time workers or or other flexible options, the most important thing is that you're honest, that you communicate really well and that you apply any rules consistently. The problems arise where, you know, to your point, I think about flex haves or have nots is that almost implies that some people are more privileged or are being given unfair treatment. So deciding what those rules are and what that framework looks like early up, communicating that well and applying it consistently is the most important thing. So for example, you know, we have a desk booking system that then allows us to say, these are the desks available. You won't necessarily be able to find the desk on the day that you want. So you need to to look and plan in advance and build that in so that you know you can go into the office and it might be you have to go in on a Monday or a Friday or you know whichever day it is. But making sure that's just a really fair system so that everyone feels like they're being treated the same is is I think the key to unlocking that. Great. And so Tamara, kind of how how have you personally changed your own life, your own working pattern? And um, how have you changed like what's the the everlasting change now that you can see with your own team but like from a personal point of view and a a team point of view what will you never do again and what will you do in the future I think that the going in five days a week will not be a part of my work experience or that of my team I think we've seen great merit in the in the flexi Um, and I think it has been wonderful as a parent to have been able to be there more for my child and to work a little bit more flexibly however I know from my own you know burnout I have to do something I have to rethink it drastically because as I know from, from my research with women, women women are working more than ever before, even, even if that's in the broader responsibilities of their role as a parent or a carer for parents, women are working disproportionately more than men in a broader view of their life. And burnout is more prevalent for women and women are more compromised. And I know from my own personal self, I have to address that. And I think linking to what Caitlin said, I mean, we had an amazing performance coach come and talk to me and my team. And she said, 
you know, that point of clarity and rules and then a team that set it out, who is, who is now working or not working? What hours are they working? Because otherwise you can have a world where people are like, are they, can I call them now? Or is this the hour that they're getting their child? Or is this the time where they, you know, is it all right to send that? And there's so much confusion in the team because all our rules have gone. You know, you wouldn't call, you know, before you wouldn't have a meeting before nine and you wouldn't have one after six, but now you're like, well, that person's working flexibly. So can I call them? And I am too. Can I call them at 7.45 after the kids are in bed? So that communication, and I think I haven't done enough of it with my team. And I listen to this and I say, I have to go and do more of that. What are the rules? What are the boundaries that we're putting in as a team and making sure that everyone is clear on that? And it will change because what they are now is not what it will be in even two months. If people start to say, I like being back more in the office, I can be back. I'm going to be in three days or four days because that suits me personally. So that constant dialogue and communication I think is absolutely critical and I think that as I said being a female leader I know that women are harder hit than men through this and so I think that protection whether it's you know the the flexi ins or the flexi outs I just think looking after the female workforce I think is a potential area we need to focus on because the data is there in 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 spades Great. And Caitlin, just we're, we're down to our last kind of few minutes now. But um, can you see like as a company how to kind of create those boundaries? And would you ever put like hard and fast rules in that you can't arrange a meeting, you can't email after a certain time? Um, would, would that be are those kind of things that you've already got in practice? Or they is that the kind of next level of kind of how work has to fit around an employee's life? that feels like the complete reverse from maybe what was happening just a few years ago? At the moment, we don't have any hard and fast rules in place because we're very much learning and trying to be flexible to everyone. And with so many employees, often hard and fast rules don't work uh, because they just will exclude part of the workforce that they don't um, accommodate. What I think is important is you know, coming back to our focus on listening and learning is, as Tamara said, things are changing. They're not going to be the same in six months as they were a year ago, and they're changing faster than ever. So we have to keep listening. So if you are a team manager, if you have a big company, or whether, you know, you're the government looking at policy for the country, I think listening is the most important thing because so much is changing. Are you asking whether it's your team, your constituents, your company for their feedback? And are you acting on that? And it might be that you try something and it doesn't work. Try something else. We can't be afraid to fail because we have to try new things at a speed we've never done before. So listen, learn, act, see if it's working or not, and then keep repeating that cycle. I think that's the mantra that we're going to keep following for the next few years. And just really quickly, have you seen a shift in men's behaviour as well as women's behaviour? I think the great thing personally I've seen a lot is because so many men were home during lockdown, they got a very new experience of parenting. Not all men, there are some fantastic stay-at-home dads that knew that, but I think it was a great eye-opener for a lot of men and maybe for some people they've got a little bit more appreciation of what it looks like to do some of that juggling than they had before. But just to emphasize, not all men, there are definitely some great stay-at-home dads out there as well. Absolutely. I've tomorrow, definitely seen, tomorrow, yeah, seen definitely, the shift in that. Definitely seen men saying, I appreciate, I now understand what my partner does and and you know <laughs> but equally they understand what I do trapped in this room on zoom so you know I think there has been and I even know from my child saying to me mummy I actually know what you do now because you, I hear you and I think even that's been a revelation I think you know and also colleagues seeing into each other's lives and I have definitely seen some of my poor limited men in my team say I want to be a bit more active in my child's life and this has made it possible because I have been doing it so I think it's created an opportunity for parents who didn't do it before as well. Yeah so very much it's kind of still work in progress I think we're still kind of navigating our way through whether um, how to make it work. I think we kind of we can't go back to how it was, but we still are kind of working out kind of what the future looks like. And I suppose the winners and and there will be some losers out of the kind of new way of working. And then then that will change change things going forward. But thank you so much, both of you have been really insightful about how you've led um, in a really positive way and towards, let's hope, a positive future for for women at work. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thanks.